take six of them and submit them to us. We'll read them and if we approve them. We'll make sure that you get a CTED uh, pedagogy certificate from uh, my provost office. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Cassandra Ori. She's our new um, uh, director of the Caltech, uh, Caltech Teaching and Learning Programs Office. And she's going to talk to us about uh, teaching and learning. thinking. 
And then I ended up working at the Center for Teaching and Learning as an associate director, getting more experience with program development, working with graduate students and faculty. Um, and eventually, uh, kind of started to think about, well, what other kinds of institutions are there? What, Harvard is its own little bubble. Um, and so to gain some different experience, I went beyond that and stayed in Massachusetts, um, going to a very small college called Curry College as a dean, um, but a dean that was really focused on professional development and teaching and learning. I was there for the last three years. Uh, we started a center for teaching and learning. Curry is a place with about 300 faculty, sounds about familiar, uh, about 2,000 students. They are mostly undergraduate rather than graduate. Uh, but the scale feels familiar. So I'm really glad to be in a place that is so high profile in terms of research and has that scale factor of a community that knows each other. And um, hopefully that just gives you a little insight into where I'm coming from and what I am passionate about. All right, so this evening I have a few goals for what I hope to um, accomplish with you. Um, this was in the advertisement, <clears throat> right? Something like evidence, values, and vision. We'll play with the order of those a little bit. We'll iterate between them a bit, but I do, I wanna give you some information, little bits at a time, not too much, because I want us to be active as well. I need to hear from you what, you're, what you value most about the teaching and learning context at Caltech, with full recognition that we are all about research, right? but we're about research in some sort of integrated way. So I wanna explore that with you a little bit. Um, and then ultimately we have to create a vision. We have to put it in words and get it out there so that this center has a, has a future and we can all kind of get behind it and create programming that will really work for Caltech. So we won't do all of that by the end of the night, but we're gonna get a really, really good start um, and we'll, we'll actually use the room in, in some different ways with the post-its and markers to get there. All right. So you all know the Caltech mission by heart, right? <laughs> Let's take a moment to, uh, to review it. I'm not gonna read it to you. A moment with the mission statement. So right off the bat, we are about research. But in the first sentence, we are somehow integrated with education. And as I'm starting to talk with people around campus, I started August 1st, by the way, so I've had a bunch of conversations already. Um, it's really clear to me that although that is the, the huge and driving focus, Caltech would not be Caltech if it weren't for the integration with education <coughs> in some very um, important ways. And if we weren't focused on educating that next generation of scientists to be creative and to solve the hardest problems, um, our sense of purpose would somehow be different. And there are places that are only research focused. But the fact that students are in labs throughout the summer, throughout the year, uh, that our graduate and our undergraduate students interact, not always in, in the traditionally expected ways, often our undergraduates are, are TAing um, as much as or as frequently as our, our graduate students are. So, this is the mission, right? This is kind of gonna inform it, but we're gonna jump in to your most important and deeply held values about being here at Caltech pretty much right away. So my question for you is what do you value about learning and teaching at Caltech? We're gonna start to put the puzzle together and I want you to get not only the question mark, but the exclamation point as well. So as we break up into small groups, um, and I'll give you a little more instruction in a moment. We will be using the post-it notes. Um, and so what I, would, what I would really like you to do is find um, actually just a moment to yourself. So here's the process that we're gonna follow. Um, and the backing up a step, the reason that we're doing this first uh, is because it's gonna be the foundation for the rest of our, of our exploration together. We gotta get the, the values right first. Um, Process-wise, I would like you to take just a minute or two on your own to jot down a few words, ideas, phrases that answer this question. What do you value? What's unique? What's important? What's special? Um, what do you hold dear about the teaching and learning environment here? Um, and then find two other people. So a group of three would be ideal. Two's okay. Four's okay. I'm not going to come after you or anything like that. Um, and compare notes, all right? Compare notes. So what goes
goes on the blue-green-ish post-its. They're scattered around the room. Who has a marker? Can you hold up your hand if you have a marker? Yeah, so, you know, if you end up in a group without a marker, just shout out, someone will have a marker near you. Blue-green are values that you agree on in some way, that your group had consensus about, that you each came up with a version of, okay? And then the red ones, can someone hold up a red one? Red, orange, those sorts of warm hues are gonna be unique. So maybe Melanie comes up with one that no one else thought of in the group. Those are gonna go on the red stickers, okay? So silent, together, post-its. Send an emissary and put them up here. Sound all right? Let's give it a try. I mean, you're good. Similar. I definitely think Caltech. I've graduated. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Caltech. Really unique for me. Just the quality of the students. I went to mid-level. I've got our green shirt on. They can change to you know the one or two percent. Kind of combines these two. The other one I wanted to mention was yeah, this one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. especially for graduate students. Okay. Um, so we should go all the way around. Caltech and graduate school in general is, is not just learning I mean, sorry, is, fractional I'm no well. science, yeah. being inducted yeah. into the community of scientists. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, uh, so I'm, I'm problem solving yeah, is part of that. Small classes, <laughs> and yeah, all of the fact that they're solving problems in class that means they don't just tell us the answers, but they show us how they get the answers. I don't think I need to Any controversial opinions? Why is that? If somebody thought something, not everybody thought. So, class A, you're Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Last call for post-its. You're all set? Okay. Anyone else? Um, but also things for cohorts of people, whether they're in disciplines, 
um, by entering status, for example, newer junior faculty at the institution. Centers typically run things like workshops, which are more one-off, as well as longer, um, more continuous kinds of opportunities that let people explore topics in greater depth. And then, like the certificate that CPET is, is running, various forms of credentials about teaching that assist people in their next steps in professional development. And in some cases, centers participate in offering coursework on university teaching. Um, so for example, um, Harvard now has required courses for graduate <coughs> students about teaching in the discipline in at least half of their arts and sciences departments. So in chemistry, for example, they come in and they, they take a course their first semester before they TA. None of these are the right solution for everywhere, but it kind of gives you a sense of the breadth of the field. And then centers do typically try to foster research that is institution specific and relevant to the population on learning and teaching and support innovation. And innovation sometimes is new, that's never been done anywhere. Sometimes it's new, we haven't done it on this campus. Sometimes it's new, we've tried it, but we'd like to do it better, um, and we'd like to really understand how it works so that research and innovation become linked together. So our colleagues at MIT um, have actually studied the process of supporting innovation and great like that. It's very meta, right? One step removed um, and studying, studying, learning, and teaching. Um, so Lori Breslin, who some of you might have met, she actually was on campus last spring. This is a quote from one of, the, um, one of their reports from the center at MIT. Educational innovation can be thought of as a design problem. Um, so innovators wish to improve upon instructional practices, but must work within a set of constraints. And she actually goes on in this, in this study to think about what elements of design we can apply to think about educational innovation. And I think this is important because the kind of research and support for innovation that Centers for Teaching and Learning can foster feels unfamiliar at times when we're coming from um, a scientific research framework. Rather than trying to answer um, a question with a per, um, an enduring and constant understanding of a phenomenon that can be isolated and studied, it is more like design in that um, we're just we're trying to meet an outcome. We're trying to do something very practical, like get our students to be able to perform and understand um, and grow in particular intellectual and skill-based ways. Uh, in design, we think about criteria. We think about what evidence we would look at to be able to know if our design worked. What what would we what would we measure? How will we know if our design is making progress? As mentioned, we have constraints. Synthesis, we think about what's been done in the field and we try to pull that together. We apply it to our new problem. Um, we might make stuff. We might actually synthesize things in the world or in, this, in the case of education, you know, new educational materials, curricula, and methods. And then we get data and we analyze it. And importantly, we iterate. We go back, we change it again. We make a tweak. We do it again. Um, it's not a one, one-shot deal, and we're never done. Um, as you know, in, in engineering and design, which I think touches so many of our research fields, even when we are studying more pure scientific type of questions, um, except for, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but very, very theoretical fields, most of us interact with design in some way. We, we have instruments that we use, we have software that we use, we iterate, we try to make it better, we fix it, we go back and we do it again when our, um, when our outcomes, when our goals and our criteria change. So <clears throat> with this evidence about teaching and learning and with the values that you have, what I want to posit is that we can start to create a vision, right? We can start to see clearly what matters at Caltech. And we're going to come back to this question of what educational, let's think of them as design problems, really matter here. But we're not gonna tackle it right away because there's actually, there's another kind of, this is my little symbol for evidence. This is actually this room, but it's a, it kind of doesn't look like it. Do you recognize it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's that room, this room. Um, so we're gonna come back to this after, if it's okay with you, 
just a brief exploration of a little bit more evidence. And that will be evidence about teaching and learning and theft. Does that sound okay? Am I just speeding through this or is it going all right? Okay, good. <clears throat> so, um, there are a lot of different you know, branches of, of evidence and lines of inquiry and instructional design, educational design for higher education. But I've just picked out a couple that I think are really interesting and that um, have started to resonate with the various conversations that I've had. But frankly, I don't know if these will be the important questions that will really matter at Caltech. And honestly, it doesn't matter. They're just here to get you thinking about the kinds of questions that you might ask that might matter to you. So the reason we're doing this is just to get the wheels turning, be a little bit inspired, have a few new terms and buzzwords maybe to play with when we break up again after just a, a couple more slides. All right. So let's explore a little bit, and that's a satellite call, explorers. Whatever, it'll become our little metaphor for the next section. Okay, so one large body of research that I find really interesting, and that I've heard people talk about without necessarily knowing the literature in this field, is something called approaches to study. I think it's been more impactful um, in the UK and in Australia in higher education in terms of how it's been talked about, but certainly people are using and looking at this work here as well. Um, basically, you, this will sound very familiar. You see students in your class. Some of them seem to be learning deeply, right? What are some things that you see when you see students learn deeply? They ask good questions. Questions, right? And so they are producing questions. They're asking for more. You know what, I never turned the lights down. Can you still see this all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Other things that you associate with deep learning. Yeah? The student gives suggestions. They have suggestions. Yeah, yeah. So they're prompt, they're self-prompting for more. They're pursuing lines of inquiry. Yes. Connections. They're, they're making still. connections. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, thank you, Julius. All right, that's great. So they are, they're integrating, they're making connections between silos or buckets. Doesn't matter what course it's from, they're putting the, the thinking together. So now the, now it all works. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that took a long time to buffer, didn't it? Okay, there you go. Okay, great. Um, institutions, his name is Ken Bain, who's written a couple of books, 2004 he wrote one called What the Best College Professors Do, uh, he just came out with one called What the Best College Students Do, it's kind of follow-up work. Um, he actually talks a lot about this kind of deep learning um, and surface learning, and then we'll talk a little bit in a moment about strategic learning, uh, but I think the titles of those books sort of mislead because these different approaches to study that you've all seen and perhaps done yourself that students take on are, are very much learnable and they're very much um, able to be influenced by the teaching and learning context, right? So it's not that, you know, Noel is a strategic learner always and forever. These are approaches that, you know, you might take in a particular instance but in another instance, you might be more apt to make deeper connections um, and really pursue understanding for yourself. So I'm not going to talk about surface learning much. My sense is that, and you can get a sense of what that is, sort of the bare minimum, not really going for understanding. But this question of strategic learning is a really interesting <laughs> one. And I, I have heard people um, be a little bit frustrated at times with, for example, um, a focus, if you look at the strategic side, on um, the intention to achieve the highest possible grade. So it's a very organized approach to doing one's work. Uh, students who are, who are tending toward a strategic approach to a particular study or assignment or task um, are very much monitoring their study, they're very organized, they're managing their time, but unfortunately, they tend to get a little bit um, too fixated <laughs> on that very specific uh, numerative goal, right? The, the goal of getting
getting the grade. Sometimes this is also called a, an achievement orientation versus a deep learning orientation. So both highly competent, um, both very much able to be influenced by what we do as teachers um, or what our context is like. And um, Bain, again, in, in a, a recent interview, says it's, it's so typical learning in college is often around preparation for an exam. Even when exams include questions that require analysis, synthesis, and evaluation, students get one shot at finding a solution and then may not have an opportunity to try a line of reasoning, get feedback, and try again. And this is an anti-exam at all. Um, he's just pointing out that what we expect in our professional lives, where we are deep learners, where we are pursuing questions and making connections, is a little bit different. If you walk down the, the hall to a colleague with a, a paper right, that you're working on, and, and they read it, and you said, well, what'd you think? And you said, feedback. And they said, well, I think you're getting a C. <laughs> Stay away. And this is a story from, from his interview, a recent interview. Um, you would not be very happy. You'd be like, well, what, what, am I, what can I improve? What, am I, what can I do better? Um, so influenced by what the context is like um, and lots of research on it. Is it relevant? Do we want to ask questions that matter at Caltech about strategic and deep learning? How would we foster deeper learning about the sciences? What would work with people here? How do we create environments um, where people tend to learn deeply even more than they already do because there is a ton of deep learning already going on at Caltech? What are the conditions that um, prompt or influence more strategic behavior versus less strategic? behavior. Do we care? I don't know. Open question. All right. So um, another, another question is perhaps about what students do when they are not in class. How do people organize their knowledge? And I just wanted to share actually um, Julius, Dr. Julius Sue is here, and his colleague Victor Kam um, are Caltech alums. Both of their doctoral degrees are at Caltech. And they're asking the question, how can, how can we provide an environment that lets students have ownership over their study? Um, connect ideas to one another, some of these deep learning traits. Share resources across people, uh, but in a way that is durable and organized and flexible, and nevertheless gives students a way, um, a path to study. So that includes some um, opportunities for prompted, study and recall, which are also very, very important in our, in our field. There's a lot of stuff we just have to have at the ready in order to think about more complex tasks. So just an example of something that's going on a little bit under the radar, but Professors Hay, Goddard, and Stoltz are, are working with um, Julius and Victor on a pilot this year to use an app in their classes that runs on an iPad that lets students organize concepts tag them in various ways. You can talk, talk to Julius about this more afterwards if you like. Um, but really interesting, in different disciplines, what are the kind of concepts that might be sticking points? So are there ideas or concepts where students are going to tend to need more examples or alternate explanations? Will they be able to organize and provide those themselves? What kind of guidance might they benefit from as they grapple with the really tough stuff in their fields? So this idea of a threshold concept is another kind of line of research and you know stuff about higher ed teaching and learning. Yeah, question. No, I, mean, I know it's not your app, but I don't. Maybe I'm the only one, but I don't really understand what you're saying here. Are these PowerPoint slides that no. you're linking together? Are these one-word concepts that you're linking together? I mean, is one of these you can think of these as cards or um, flexible units of learning. Well, what I'm asking about is scale. Right? Yeah. It is, it is and it's totally flexible. What does that mean? Though? So if you're teaching a class, and we can talk with Julius about this, you want to just answer the question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, our, our idea is that we want to make everything pretty fine-grained. So 
this could be on, on the level of a PowerPoint slide. This could be on the level of a question. Um, and we're very interested in how these very fine-grained ideas accumulate. They build up into other larger ideas, and larger ideas accumulate into even larger ideas. Um, and we'd like to build links not only within you know, individual slides in the lecture, but between lectures, between courses, and even between universities. We'd like to interlink everything together and sort of get a sense for, I, I mean, on, on, some, on some level, like all these lectures are very linear, right? It's like slides one through N, and they're presented in the same sequence to, let's say, 50 students. But in reality, it's a big mesh of concepts. And every student might have a different understanding of a different set of concepts. And so we'd sort of like to, I don't know about the word empower, <laughs> but, 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 but to make it possible for uh, each student to say, look, these are the things I know, these are the things I don't know. And maybe the path I would take to get from like algebra to nuclear physics would, would be different from a path someone else would take if they knew calculus and quantum mechanics, but you know, not chemistry or something. I mean, they could find different paths through the same maze of concepts. And yet we can be guiding them through some of those pathways. Mm -hmm. So coming back to what the hard concepts are in a discipline, if you think of them as some sort of a, like a threshold, and this is a word that's just been used in the literature, but there, there are ideas or concepts in every field that are somehow transformative. Think of the idea of a limit in mathematics. And you all might not remember that moment when you, you know, you've seen the limit and you're high school or junior high or elementary teacher, <laughs> whatever you encountered <laughs> this stuff, um, showed you what a limit was and taught you like, oh, what is a limit? And then you get it, right? At some point, you're like, oh, that's a limit. And it's you can't go back, really. You can't, um, it's not a fact you can forget. It's a deeper idea that a ton of other stuff rests upon until you really get what a limit is deeply it's very hard to proceed very much farther in a lot of fields uh, mathematics and, and the sciences included so if there are concepts in different fields that students particularly struggle with they're troublesome in some deep way um, something like a technology like the skies app might help us understand how students navigate those thresholds, those conceptual thresholds. What do they do to get themselves unstuck? We haven't known this ever. Like you go away, you study it, and then you come back and you somehow know it, right? But you know, what if we had better information about the kinds of examples, connections, um, you know, additional problems, alternate explanations those threshold concepts might benefit from? So again, it's just an example. It might matter, it might not. I don't know. Here's another just very recent one. Um, not recent, actually. The, the research has been around for a long time on something called stereotype threat. But there was just a little op-ed piece in the New York Times. Did anyone see this recently? Yeah, a couple of people did. So stereotype threat is a really well-known phenomenon. It's basically sitting in the room, I'm going to give you some kind of cognitive or learning task, maybe it's an exam or an assignment, and I somehow remind you about a stereotype that exists. So if I was sitting in the room and someone just reminded me that, oh, maybe that women are less good at spatial reasoning, we don't really know. I will probably perform less well on that task than I otherwise would have. And you might actually perform less well as well, even though you are a male, because you've also been reminded that you're supposed to be better at it. Mm -hmm. So when we're distracted by, by these anxiety-provoking um, kinds of, of judgments and assumptions that might affect us or affect our perceived performance, it impacts our, our apparent intelligence and ability. Um, so this has been around for a long time. And there are very similar lines of, of research about the kind of feedback that teachers give to students, right? So you know a little bit about what are you thinking about? Well, I'm not thinking about like the from friends I have. But, okay, yeah. But there, there's actually research that, that suggests or shows that you know if you do a task, if you perform some sort of a task, you do a problem set or something, and I come by and I comment on. Some, something specific about the work that you've done, how you solved a particular part of the problem, and just make a neutral comment about that, you're going to be more likely to choose a 
harder problem next and be faster and better at doing that than if I had come by and said, you're really smart, good job, right? So when we make statements that are fixed about other people's intelligence, it affects their performance in sometimes surprising ways. So this stuff's been out there for a long time. I think what was beautiful about this little op-ed in the New York Times is this statement that we should use this insight to create conditions for brilliance. People have gotten into Caltech because they have the intelligence and they have the ability, and I've been told this in all kinds of orientations and, um, and things that I believe in, because people here are fantastic. So is it a relevant question to ask, what can we do to create conditions for brilliance where we um, purposefully create those, that environment where there aren't the distractions about fixed assumptions or stereotypes or other kinds of distractions? Again, I don't know if it's going to be a relevant question or not. So I'm going to come back to this question. I know we started a little bit late, so we're kind of running out of time. But we'll spend five minutes or so on this one. If you can come back together with your small group, I would love it if you have a conversation and then just record what you get on a post-it note. Maybe one educational, one to two educational design problems that you think might matter <coughs> at Caltech. So we'll spend about five minutes on this and then hopefully get some post-its up here at the end. So, all right, yes? I don't quite understand the question here. Could you? Um provide maybe one example of something you might be expecting to help me understand yeah. more or less what you're looking sure. for. Sure, so the last several slides have been kind of examples about what might matter. Does it, does it matter um, just creating conditions for brilliance? Is that a question that would be relevant at Caltech? Um, how does teaching impact deep and surface learning? And maybe you customize that to your particular field. But what you've seen is some little glimpses into some things that we kind of know about teaching and learning. What I'm curious about is what you've seen in your own experiences and what you want to know. Right? So whether there's background on it or not, I don't really care. So you might start with something that you see in your students in classes or that you as a student have experienced. Or a frustration or a question that you've had as a teacher. Would it be more effective if I did this or that or something else. Um, what I'm really curious about is the questions that you would want to have answered, the design problems that you hope we eventually get to solve here at Caltech. Does that help? Okay. Cool. Let's spend about five minutes and then we'll wrap it up from there. But I don't know, the, the answers may be different for people who are 8 and people who are 21. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really follow very well what, what context you were trying to do. It's a hysteria type of that. Do you think primarily the app makes the students 
learn better, or are they up making the way that they teach their primary? Are you primarily wanting to see what the students do? Not to change what the students do, but just to help the teacher. Uh, but, so, uh, in our you actually go back, back it's so it's like a very yeah. similar to get the chance to do when you go back to the sort of one of these like so but it's very much like lines of wear in the middle and that was the same thing the teachers can put it in the slide where they're 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 in the slide where they are 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 in the